Please turn in your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 37, going way back. Genesis 37, today I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. I want to begin by telling you that this is a two-part sermon, a two-part sermon. We're going to kick it off this morning, we're going to hit pause at the end of the service, and then we're going to pick right back up where we left off next week. It's different from a two-part series, because so a series is multiple sermons that are wrapped around a certain theme, right? Well, a two-part sermon is just one message, but there's so much content in that one message that instead of covering it in one week, it's going to take multiple weeks. So if you're here today, you're going to want to make sure that you're here next week for part two, because we're going to end on a cliffhanger. While you are uh, turning there to Genesis 37, I have a question for you. Has God ever given you a dream? Has God ever given you a dream? You know, all through history we see examples of God speaking to man through dreams. In the Old Testament in Genesis 20, we read about how God came to Abimelech in a dream. And then in Matthew, right after Jesus was born, it says that an angel of the Lord came to Joseph in a dream and told Joseph that he needed to take Mary and new baby Jesus and flee to Egypt because Herod was going to kill all the babies. And then later, it says that an angel of the Lord came to Joseph again in a dream after Herod had died and told him it's safe to go back home. God uses dreams. We even read In the book of Job, it tells us that God speaks to us in many different ways, now one way and and then another. And then it says, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds, God uses dreams to speak to us. Sometimes I wonder if that's because that's the only time that we'll get quiet enough to actually listen to him. He's like, well, if you're not going to shut up, I'll just wait till you're asleep. Or maybe it's the only time that the Lord can tell us what he wants to tell us without our own thoughts and opinions getting in the way. Yeah, but God, what about, but God, what about, and he's like, just listen. I know what I'm doing. Well, for whatever reason, God does use dreams to speak to us. But today I'm not only asking you if God has come to you in your sleep and given you a dream. I'm asking if God has placed a dream inside of you. Has God placed a dream so far inside of you that you can't think about anything else? Today, if you're sitting here saying to yourself, what is he talking about? Then I'll answer the question for you. No, he hasn't given you a dream. Because when God gives you a dream, you know it. Because there are people in this room today, or perhaps people who are listening to this message online, who have been given a dream by God. And that dream is so deep inside of them that it's become part of them. It's part of who they are. If you've been given a dream by God, then it's that thing that when when your day gets quiet and your mind goes silent, you automatically start thinking about that dream. And when you do, it makes you excited, makes you happy, and you you, you just want to get it done. That's what a dream from the Lord feels like. I love coming into contact with people who have been given a dream from the Lord. Christina and I have a friend. Her name is Tammy. She came to me years ago at my previous church and, and told me that that the Lord had given her a dream, and she wanted to start a women's workout group. But she didn't just want to minister to these ladies' physical needs. She wanted to teach them about feeding their spiritual needs as well, becoming a better person holistically. Tammy was given the green light on that ministry, and then she started it, and for decades she ministered to literally hundreds, if not thousands of women 
many of whom otherwise would never have been in a church. They heard about a free workout group from a friend of theirs, and they said, well, I need to work out, and it's free. I'll go. And Tammy used that group not only to help those women better themselves physically, but to share the love of Christ with them, to mentor them and to teach them about the part of man that we don't see, our spirit. What a dreamer. Another woman I know, she's actually the woman who's cut my hair for 20-some-odd years. Her name's Tina, and she goes to the Bentonville Church of the Nazarene. And one time the Lord gave her a dream to do something around Christmas time to minister to people who were just going through a rough patch, who just needed to feel loved. Tina started a ministry called Wrapped in Love. And what they would do is they would have a dinner, and they would sell tickets to this dinner to raise money for the ministry, and then they would invite people to this dinner. And no one ever knew whether they were coming to the dinner just to see other people be blessed or whether they were going to get blessed themselves. They didn't expect to be blessed. They just wanted to be a part of something bigger than them. But what they would do is they would identify people who were going through a rough patch, and, and while they're sitting there eating dinner, they would call their name and say, hey, can you come up on the stage? And these, these women would go up on the stage and they would bless them in some way. Maybe they'd give them something small like a, a date night out with their husband, free child care provided, because they knew that they needed that. Or maybe they gave the woman who had worked herself too much a spa day and said, you know what, we love you. We know you're going through a lot with your family right now. We just want to give you a spa day. Well, that dream became so big and so exciting and so contagious that other people in the community who had nothing to do with that church said, I want to get involved, and they started donating things to Wrapped in Love. Two years ago, I heard stories of there was a woman who she and her family had never taken a vacation, and they gave them a vacation, sent them on a vacation, all-inclusive. There was another family who had had some financial problems and their car was having problems and they, they bought all brand new tires for the car and I think they put a new transmission in it or something like that. There was another lady who desperately needed a medical procedure but couldn't afford it and it was provided for her for free. A doctor heard about wrapped in love and said, is there anything I can do to help? And Tina was like, well, yeah, this lady needs this procedure done. He's like, I'll do it for free. All because of a dream. A good friend of mine named Brad used to have a life that was controlled by drugs and alcohol. He was in bad shape. He and his wife both were addicted to drugs and alcohol, and they were on the, the tail end of a 72-hour binge. And it was a Sunday morning, and they were just flipping through the channels, and a TV preacher came on. Brad told me, I don't know why, I just stopped. And he said, baby, come in here, we need to listen to this guy. This TV preacher was on there, and, and he told him, you're a sinner and you need Jesus. And so Brad and his wife found a little church that was down the road from them, and they went there that Sunday evening, and they gave their lives to Christ. And then they went out to celebrate that occasion by smoking a joint. They still had some discipling to go through, right? <laughs> but several years ago, the Lord gave Brad a dream to start a ministry to people who were living the life that he had lived before. So Brad is actively involved in that ministry and changing lives every day. What a dreamer. And there are dreamers in our church, too. In fact, the whole reason this church, the whole reason Centerpoint Church exists is because God gave me a dream. And you want to know something? It hasn't been fulfilled yet. That's the crazy part about it. I can't wait to see when God fulfills that dream. 
but I'm not the only dreamer in our church. There's others too. There's one man in our congregation that has a dream to build a youth activity center in the city of Lowell. I'm so excited about that dream. I can't wait to see that come to pass, and I really, really hope we get to be a part of it. In fact, what I really hope is that someday somebody gives us the land to build an activity center and lets us put a church building on the land with it. And we can run that activity center and provide something for the kids in Lowell to do. I love interacting with dreamers. I love seeing dreams. But today I want us to look at a passage about a dreamer. And see what we can learn from his story. We're looking in Genesis. We're not going to read his whole story because it is several chapters long. It would take an extensive amount of time to read it. But we're going to read the beginning of his story. And then hopefully I can adequately tell the rest of it. We're talking about a man named Joseph. But not Jesus' stepfather Joseph. This is Old Testament Joseph. Joseph was one of 12 sons of a man named Jacob, or Israel. These 12 sons would become the heads of their family and would eventually their families would become what we now know as the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. Joseph was one of only two sons that were given to Jacob by his favorite wife, Rachel. Joseph was the second youngest in the family and was born much later than his brothers. And Jacob loved him. Well, One day Joseph had a dream. I want us to read about that now. Genesis chapter 37, verses 3 through 8. It says, Now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age. It says, and he made him an ornate robe. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Verse 5, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. So 17-year-old Joseph, in his fancy jacket from dad, has a dream. Church, do you know how people learn? That's right. We learn through mistakes. You touch a hot stove, you learn not to do that again. You go to a bad restaurant and get food poisoning, you learn not to go there again. You jump off a cliff in Honduras and land sideways in a pool of water, bursting your eardrum, you learn not to do that again. We learn from mistakes. But you know what really smart people do? They learn from other people's mistakes. It's a lot better that way. And I know that we have a room full of smart people here today. So today we're going to learn from Joseph's mistake. What we're going to learn is the first thing that we need to do when God gives us big dreams. The first thing that you do is protect the dream. Protect the dream. Everybody say protect the dream. So Joseph had this dream, right? And it was definitely from the Lord. It was a good dream. But he doesn't protect it. Instead, he blabs it to the worst possible audience. He didn't tell his friends. He didn't tell his girlfriend. He went and told the brothers who the dream was about. Even people who don't know the rest of the story. 
Anyone who's never read this and don't know the rest of the story, I know that when we read verses 6 and 7, you were like, oh, Joseph, what are you doing? Joseph says, hey, guys, listen to this dream I had. We were all out binding sheaves of grain. All of a sudden, mine stood up tall and proud, and all of yours bowed down to it. What do you think that means? Really, Joseph? Really? But Joseph isn't alone in this. I see it happen all the time. God gives someone a dream, and they're so excited about it that they'll tell anyone who will listen. And that's a really bad idea. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but most people are not fans when you have a dream. See, there's several different types of people when it comes to our dream. The first type that you could share your dream with is a champion. I like sharing my dreams with champions. A champion is someone who gets excited about your dream. They just want to see it come to pass. Champion is someone who says, I'll do whatever I can to help you. Let me help you. Let me carry this for you. Let me help you be successful. That's a champion. We all want to share our dreams with champions. And in fact, when we share our dream with someone, we hope that they're a champion. The bad news is they're probably not because a very, very small percentage of people are champions when it comes to your dream. The second group is the chameleon. Chameleons look like champions when they're with you. A chameleon says, man, that's an awesome dream. I'm excited about that dream. I want to help you. I want to do anything I can to help you make that dream come true. Just like a champion, right? The problem is the chameleon has no loyalty to your dream. The chameleon doesn't dream themselves, so they just want to be part of a dream. So they're excited about your dream until they see a shinier one. They're like, oh, that dream's better. So long, dreamer. Guys, I've seen this in the church world for years and years. Someone will hear about the vision of the church, and they're so excited about it. They're like, oh, I want to be a part I want to help this church. I want to help it grow. It's going to be awesome. We're going to, we're going to reach the whole area for Jesus. Well, then a new church opens up. And then they feel led to go to the new church and carry that dream. That's a chameleon. Chameleons are just on board with whatever the newest dream is. Now, chameleons are bad but they're not as bad as the next group. The next group is the crook. Crooks are just what they sound like, thieves. You tell a crook your dream, you know what happens? Next week you see it happening in living color right in front of you because a crook steals your dream. Now that wouldn't necessarily be bad if they were doing it right. Because if you really have a dream from the Lord, you don't care who gets the credit. You don't care who's doing it as long as it's getting done, right? If I tell my dream, a dream excuse me, to a champion, and there's someone who's better than me at carrying that dream forward, I'm like, go for it. Love it. I saw this in action last weekend. New Song Church in Centerton. New Song Church was a church plan a little over 11 years ago in Centerton, Arkansas. New Song Church was started by a man named Jim Severn. Short time after he planted that church, Jim passed away. Well, now one of Jim's former students, when Jim was a youth minister, is a guy named C.J. Brummett, and he's the pastor of that church. And C.J.'s a champion. He's carrying that vision forward. But last week at their dedication service, they just built a new building and they dedicated it. And Christina and I got to be at that dedication service on Saturday. And Jim Severn's wife stood on the platform and told their story about how they started the church. And then said, I am so happy for New Song Church and for where Clyde is taking us. Clyde is CJ's given name. 
You see, CJ's not a crook. He's a champion. So she didn't care who's getting the credit. She just cares that there's a healthy church in Centerton that's reaching people. But if a crook takes your dream, the problem is it's not their dream, so they don't have the details. They corrupt it. They twist it. And they turn it into something different. You don't ever want a crook to have your dream. But Joseph's brothers weren't champions, chameleons, or crooks. They were the last group. They were the largest group that there is. Critics. Have you ever told your dream to a critic? I have. Boy, that's not fun. See, critics, all they're going to do is tell you how bad your dream is, how dumb your dream is, and how dumb you are for having dreamt it. They're going to tell you everything that's wrong with it and why it won't work. See, a critic, they don't want your dream to come true. A critic wants your dream to fail because they're jealous of it. That's what Joseph's brothers were. They were critics. They said, are you kidding me? You're going to dream that? That's a dumb dream. We're all older than you. If anybody's going to be in charge, it should be me. I'm older than you are. I'm the oldest one. Critics don't want your dream to come true, and sometimes they'll take steps to ensure that it doesn't happen. Now, did you notice that out of all the groups of people that you could tell your dream to, that there's a very small percentage that gives you anything except for a bad outcome? Best case scenario, you've got a 20 to 25% chance that you'll tell your dream to the right person, that they're a champion. You see, you have to protect your dreams. You've got you to give your dream time to incubate, time to grow. You have to protect it like a mother hen protects her baby in an egg. You don't just go tell your dream to people and let them kill it. You protect it. I told you earlier that this church is here because God gave me a dream. Let me tell you something. I haven't shared that dream with very many people. I've been very, very careful who I shared that dream with. And in fact, even when we were having launch team meetings and sharing the vision about the church and and having to share parts of that dream just to let people know what we're about and what we're going to do, There are still parts of the dream that nobody knows except me, God, and Christina. Told her because I know she's a champion. By the way, if you're looking for a champion to tell your dream to, tell that woman. She cares more about your dreams than she does her own. First thing you have to do to your dream is protect it. Joseph didn't do that. He told his brothers the worst possible audience that you could imagine, the biggest group of critics. So the next thing that happens in our story is Joseph's brothers are out tending the flock. They were shepherds. And Jacob tells Joseph, go check on your brothers and see how they're doing. So Joseph is going, and he's going to check on their brothers, his brothers, excuse me, and then they see him coming from afar off. And here's what they say in verse 20. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal has devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. They say, here comes this dreamer. Let's throw him in this well and see what happens. See what happens to his sheave of grain when it's sitting at the bottom of a well. Well, Joseph's brother Reuben says, well, let's not kill him. He's our brother. Instead, let's just throw him in the well and leave him. Don't kill him and throw him in the well. Just throw him in there and leave him there. Reuben's plan, the Bible tells us, was to come back and get Joseph later and take him back to his father. Now, it doesn't tell us why. Maybe to gain favor with his father. Who knows? 
But it says he was going to come back later and get them. So they're like, all right, well, we'll do that. We'll just throw them in here and leave them. So they throw Joseph in the cistern. And then it says they sit down to eat their lunch. Isn't that crazy? Can you imagine that scene? We had a skit last week, so we won't do it again this week. But can you imagine sitting there and there's a well behind you and Joseph's like, hey, guys, hey, guys, let me out. Please, I won't dream anymore. Just let me out. You're trying to eat your sandwich and that man's doing all that. How rude of him. Well, while they're eating their lunch, they see a caravan of Midianite slave traders. And one of the brothers says, hey, instead of just leaving him here, we don't get anything out of that. Let's sell him to them. Make him a slave. Then we get paid. So they do. They pull him up out of the well and they sell him to the slave traders. And then they take his fancy jacket and they rip it up and they dip it in blood and they take it home to their dad. They take it home to Jacob who surmises that his favorite son must have been killed by a wild animal. Meanwhile, it says the Midianites sold Joseph to a man named Potiphar, who was one of Pharaoh's officials. And Joseph does an awesome job working for him. In fact, Genesis 39 tells us this. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. So Potiphar sees that his slave is doing an awesome job at everything he does, and he figures out, well, it must be the Lord. So he says, you know what, from now on, you're in charge of my whole house. You're not a slave anymore. You're, you're the man. You're in charge. Things are going good for Joseph here, aren't they? I mean, the dream's not coming true. But who cares, right? I mean, here I am. I have anything I want. I'm in charge of one of Pharaoh's top officials' homes. I can do whatever I want. I can go wherever I want. This is a good life. Maybe I don't need to worry about that dream anymore. Because everything's good for now. Unfortunately, things don't stay that way for two reasons. Number one, Joseph is a good-looking man. And number two, Potiphar has a wife. One day it says while Potiphar was away on a trip, his wife goes to Joseph and says, come to bed with me. Now that's where we're going to hit pause on the story. I told you it was going to be a cliffhanger. And no cheating. You're not allowed to read Genesis 39 through 43. You're, you're forbidden from reading that story this week. But before we go, I want to tell you the second thing that you have to do when God gives you a big dream. Because Joseph has a decision to make here. Potiphar's wife says, come to bed with me. I wish it would have told us what she looked like. I wish we would have known how easy the decision was for Joseph. I shouldn't have said that. That was not in the notes. But I'll tell you, I've always envisioned the fact that it was a difficult decision to make. The second thing you have to do when God gives you a big dream is honor the dream. You have to honor it. You have to live with integrity. You, you can't go to bed with Potiphar's wife. 
some of you are confused. You're like, what do you, I, I don't get it. What do you mean? Let me tell you something. When you've been given a dream from the Lord, there's going to be a lot of Potiphar's wives. And I'm not talking about women. Although in some cases it could be. Potiphar's wife may be a new job that takes you away from the dream that God has given you. You say, well, I've got this dream, but man, this is an opportunity that I just can't pass up. What do you expect me to do, pastor? I hate my current job. I don't want to go get, I don't want to stay here. I'm, I, man, they're offering me more money. They're offering me a free company car. They're, all I got to do is just move away. Or all I got to do is just free up some more of my time, the, the time that I was using working on the dream. Potiphar's wife can be time. It could be free time. It could be family time. It could be, man, I know that God's given me this dream and I want to see it happen, but I really want to watch this game right now. Where I really want to watch this TV show. I need to know what happens to these zombies. Potiphar's wife could be money. You may not believe it, but sometimes people will, will pay you to not pursue a God-given dream. You know, the, we had a case here in Northwest Arkansas a while back where there was a Christian college who, through a chain of events, was, was somehow bribing politicians to make sure that the college got money. And I've never read their mission statement or their vision statement or their values, but they're a Christian college. You've got to believe that they knew that's not all right. And the man that was in charge of that college, surely he was there because God gave him a dream, right? But then there was Potiphar's wife. Church, if you've got a dream from the Lord, you cannot let Potiphar's wife get in the way. You have to honor that dream. You have to be true to it. And in reality, before Potiphar's wife ever came up, I think Joseph may have been making this mistake anyways. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But it makes it real clear that he was working for Potiphar and that he was doing a good job and life was great. It would have been real easy for Joseph to say, you know what? Maybe I was wrong about that dream. I mean, I really was sure of it. I really did know that it was God. I, I, I mean, I knew it, but maybe I was wrong. Maybe that's not what I was meant for. Church, the first thing you have to do with a big dream is you have to protect it. The second thing you have to do is you have to honor it. Now, here's what I want to do. I want everyone in the room, bow your head and close your eyes. And I'm going to ask two questions, and then we're going to have a time of prayer. The first question is this. Do you have a big dream that you haven't protected? You've told the wrong people, and because you have, you're facing problems. If that's you, there's nothing you can do to take those words back. There's nothing you can do to change it. But I want to pray for you that God will resolve the mistake that you've created. So if that's you, lift up your hand. All right, thank you. You put your hands down. Who else? Who else? All right, number two. You're here and you say, man, I've got this dream. At one point in time, I was convinced that it was God. It had to be God. But man, other things have gotten my attention. 
Other things have pulled me away. I'm not honoring the dream right now. And maybe right now Satan's telling you it's too late. No matter what he says, no matter what that preacher says right now, you better not raise your hand because it's too late for your dream. You dishonored it and it's gone. I want to tell you that's not true. Because as long as you still have breath in your lungs, that dream still has a chance. So if that's you, you say, man, I've got this dream. I haven't been paying attention to it. I haven't been honoring it. I've been chasing other things. I've been chasing money. or I've been chasing another job. I've been chasing free time. I've been chasing women. Whatever it is. But you say, you know what? I, I want that dream. And I want to honor it. Hey, guys. Right now in our service, we're giving the congregation the opportunity to respond to today's word by picking a next step. Today, we want to give you that same opportunity. So if you want to do that, I want to ask you to do three things for me. The first thing is, please pray right now and ask God to help you seal this message into your life and change areas that need to be changed. Second, I want to ask you to click the link below to fill out our online connection card and select your next step. And then finally, I want to invite you to join us this Sunday morning at 10, 10 a.m. at Centerpoint Church. We can't wait to see you and bring someone with you. God bless you. Have a great day.